Good afternoon. I am uh, Michael Ignatieff, the president and rector of Central European University. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you all today. I welcome, there's some representatives of the diplomatic community. Uh, my particular welcome is to members of the Hungarian scientific community who've come here in large numbers from other institutions in Budapest and across Hungary to be part of this extraordinary symposium. Uh, I wish I could greet you in the Hungarian language, but I hope, despite the fact I'm speaking to you in English, that you will feel the full warmth of the welcome of this institution. I say this with particular feeling not to turn this into a political event, but you'll be aware that Central European University has had a few little local difficulties with the authorities. Uh, I, I should tell you that we, uh, the authorities have been in negotiations, not with us, but with the state of New York, and we trust and hope that those negotiations will be successful. But I think it's appropriate for me to say, particularly to members of the Hungarian scientific community, that this university feels deeply part of Hungarian academic and scientific life, we are tremendously grateful for the support that we've received from Hungarian uh, institutions of higher learning. We have tremendous respect for Hungarian uh, academic traditions. We feel part of those traditions. We want nothing other than to contribute to them. And so we bid you an especially warm welcome. I bid a warm welcome to our students from CU and our faculty from CU and staff. We're in for a treat. Uh, I want to thank the Cognitive Science Department of this university, a department without, I have to watch my words carefully as a rector since I don't want to appear to be displaying favoritism of an outrageous kind, but I think all of CU is proud of the Department of Cognitive Science proud that this department has such a distinguished record uh, of publication and research. It's one of the departments that does experimental science at CU. And so in addition to our strengths in social sciences and humanities, which have been recognized, cognitive science uh, takes us into the field and consolidates our reputation in the field of science itself. Um, I also want to thank the people you're going to hear from this afternoon because there's no way to avoid the fact that these incredibly distinguished scientists have come to this university to simply say uh, give their support to Central European University. I do not want to put words in their mouths or even urge them to say a word about CU. I just simply want to acknowledge as the rector and president, my deep gratitude to these great scientists for, for joining us today. Um, as some of you may know, uh, a great Hungarian scientist, Georgi Buzaki, is going to, who's going to be speaking today, um, one of the great treasures of Hungarian science, is going to be honored by the University of Pech tomorrow. And uh, they're making a big deal of him, as they damn well should. And, uh, He's brought some very distinguished company along with him, and that's the train of circumstances that has led to this wonderful afternoon, uh, the Neuroscience Symposium. Um, I just want to pay personal direct tribute to Georgi Buzaki for having this idea of doing something at CU. Thank him personally, looking him squarely in the eye and thanking him for that to thank his colleague and friend John O'Keefe for uh, coming this way, to May Britt Moser and Edvard Moser who will be joining us shortly. Um, this is a very significant moment for our university. You've come at a wonderful time, a time in which we feel very optimistic about our future in Budapest. But there's simply no question that we are in Budapest in part because a lot of people stood up and said, stay. A lot of people stood up. Some of you are in the room. Some of you are not in the room, but as your rector and president, the fact that you all said stay was hugely important. And uh, we hope that we will reward your confidence with friendship and collaboration in the years ahead. Um, 
I will leave the, uh, uh, the proceedings uh, in the hands of more competent uh, hands than mine, but I do want to, again, pay tribute to the people coming. We are going to learn a great deal about brain mechanisms of navigation in physical and cognitive spaces. Um, if I can introduce a, a, a personal note, uh, basic science, fundamental science, science asking um, questions about how the world works and how the brain works are um, always important. Um, and they're not just important because they will lead to relieve human misery. Uh, members of my family have been very familiar with Alzheimer's disease, to just give you a practical example of human misery. Uh, neuroscience, therefore, is at a critical uh, point in relation to the relief of very, very real human misery. That's not the reason why you do it. That's not its only justification, but boy, is it important. And as someone who has benefited all my life from the advances that neuroscience has made in relation to these very personal and painful areas, I can only thank these scientists for what they've uh, uh, done. And um, so the additional point to make, and then I really will shut up, is we are in what is laughingly referred to as a post-truth, post-fact political environment in which politics is decided by how strongly you feel about something and how strongly your opinions range on a particular issue. Uh, this is a, a symposium whose tacit agenda, never stated, but let me make it explicit, is a vindication of what universities are for. In a free society, this is a university with an open society mission, we are stubborn believers that there is such a thing as knowledge. We are stubborn believers that there are some things that are true and some things that are false. Finding the truth is incredibly difficult. Part of the reason that these scientists are justly entitled to acknowledgement, gratitude, fame, and high reward is that they have paid a very, very high price for being relentless searchers after the truth, falsifiable knowledge. They must have had many hours in which the experiments did not prove what they wanted to prove. And then they had the guts to go back and try again. So if I can moralize for a second, the pursuit of knowledge is a very arduous moral discipline. And we celebrate these great scientists because they've understood that discipline, followed it utterly, with results that have improved life for all of us. And in a world, as I say, where people think there is no such thing as facts, that knowledge is disputable, that everything's relative, and that, it, and that all that matters is what a powerful man or woman says to you loudly, insistently. Um, these are people who believe, in fact, that public policy is dependent on knowledge, that politics is dependent upon truth, and a free society is dependent on truth. End of sermon, folks. Sorry to get carried away, but this is because it's such a wonderful occasion. And now I'd like to ask John O'Keefe, Nobel Laureate in Medicine and uh, from the University College London to take over. And I hope you will give this great man a very warm welcome. Well, thank you very much, Rector, for that kind introduction. And, and for all of the words of your introduction, which I, I have to admit I agree with, um, and I would uh, like to have my name made to those who fervently hope that uh, the uh, CEU remains in, in Budapest. Um, I'm going to spend most of my talk talking about um, our own work and the work of others who have contributed to our understanding of uh, what a part of the brain the hippocampus does. Uh, and specifically that it acts as a cognitive map. And I want to spend some time talking particularly about how cognitive maps are, are actually formed. And towards the end, where, where is the chair, where is Joseph? If, if I have enough time, 
um, I would like to broaden some of uh, the concepts that we have derived from our understanding of this part of the brain um, to, to generalize them to more cognitive functions and to try to see how they might apply to uh, the, the way in which uh, people make decisions, not just rats, I'll be talking mostly about rats, but how people make decisions, and to say something more broadly about <clears throat> The, uh, one of the things that, that uh, Michael uh, actually referred to is, is the, the whole difference between um, uh, curiosity-driven research and translational research, um, and also then to broaden it a bit more to uh, the role of universities in, in, in modern, modern societies. So let me then um, uh, get on uh, with it. Some years ago, um, in fact over 40 years ago to be specific, um, we decided that um, it would be a very interesting thing to do to look at the activity of cells in a part of the brain called the hippocampus. And I've shown you several uh, pictures of the hippocampus, both in rats here and in humans here. And here's a, a very nice rotating picture where you can see the hippocampus in red in humans. Um, and here's a little bit of the structure of it, which I won't go into in, in any great detail. Um, I, I've been in an anatomy department for 40 years, and it's part of my contract that I have to have at least one, and sometimes two anatomical slides, so bear with me. Um, because what I want to do is tell you what the results were when, many years ago, uh, in pursuit of cells which we thought would be memory cells, Jonathan Dostrovsky and I found that cells in this area here of the hippocampus of the rat responded to the animal's location in space. It was totally unexpected. Um, and uh, as I say, we put the electrodes into this here. So what you do is you put electrodes into a part of the brain and then you let the animal go about its, its normal business. And you listen in on the cells and you just listen to see what the cells are interested in. Turns out that this part of the brain is very favorable for that kind of analysis because most of the time, the cells aren't interested in anything. They just are very quiet. But then every once in a while, the cells wake up and they go brrrp. And I'll show you an example of that, hopefully, in a, in a second. And they start to fire. And so the job then of, of the experimenter is to actually find out what the cells are firing to. And it took us a while to do that. But in the end, we decided that it wasn't anything about what the animal was doing or anything it was interested in or anything about why it was doing it, it was where in the environment that the animal was making, making the behavior. That was the important thing for these cells. Other parts of the brain have other interests. So let me see if I can get this video to work. Because this shows you a modern version. It's a cartoon which was, which was created. Yeah, okay, it's created from real data. And what you're seeing is little red dots which are dropped in the location where the cell fires. So as the animal goes around, he's looking for food, he's slightly hungry, and as he goes around this environment, you can see that the cell is by and large quiet in most of the area that the animal visits. But when he goes over to this area here, the cell becomes active. And it turns out that this is the most dominant feature of these cells, and they're interested in where the animal is. They're slightly interested in what he's doing there, so some of them are more interested if he's turning left or right or finds food or doesn't food. But the primary correlate, the thing the cells are interested in is where the animal is. So as a result of that, and we, it was only a very small number of cells, we found about seven or eight of these cells, we thought, okay, what does this mean about this structure? As I say, we thought it was a memory structure in humans, but here it seemed to be much more specific. It seemed to be a spatial memory structure. And there had been uh, some history uh, in the past, and particularly in psychology, and I'll show you a quote from Edward Tolman. Um, there had been some suggestion in the psychological literature that there might be a part of the brain which actually produced something called a cognitive map, which enabled animals to find their way around an environment using a flexible strategy. And that word flexible is one of the keys to the whole thing. Animals can use lots of different strategies to find their way around the world. But this mapping system operates according to the principles of a map and allows animals to operate very flexibly. So I want to tell you a little bit about the evidence that that's the, what it actually does. And then I want to spend a bit of time saying, how it learns, how does this part of the system, how does this part of the brain learn, how does it create maps, and I'll tell you, it does it on the basis of curiosity. It does it on the basis of an innate program where when an animal goes into an environment, he wants to create a map of that environment. 
This is a, the opposite of a lot of other parts of the brain, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about them as well. So in conclusion, Jonathan and I concluded that this part of the brain might provide a spatial reference map, and we alluded to this man, Tolman, uh, who had actually uh, uh, talked about it. Now, one of the things that was very influential in our thinking was that if you look at just one cell, then you see that it fires in one little area here, as shown, for example, by this heat map, which tells you where the cell fires. So just imagine the animals running around this environment here, and it's only when you get a very strong red spot in the heat map that, that tells you where the cell is interested. But if you look at lots of cells, here are 32 cells here recorded at the same time, then you see each one of them is interested in a different part of the environment. So there are cells responding to all the top of the environment here, the upper part of the environment, to the lower part of the environment, to the left side, to the right side, and in the middle. You don't have to record from very many cells to see that they cover an entire environment. Put the animal in another environment, and the same cells, some of the same cells become active and respond in different places. Other cells, which you didn't even know were there, start to respond, and, uh, and some of the ones that responded here aren't responding there. So it, it, I don't think it took very much of a leap of imagination to think this looks like a map. This is the sort of thing that you might expect for, uh, to have a map. So around this time, a man called Lynn Adel uh, joined us, and we started thinking about what is a map? What do we know about maps? What do we know about the difference between maps and other ways of finding your way around, uh, such as routes? Um, so we set out and, 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 and talked about, in, in a book we wrote around 1978, about the difference between maps and routes. And as I'll show you, there was a lot in the literature already. What we realize is that if you're interested in space, you're tapping into one of the richest literatures uh, in the history of, of human thought. There was information in mathematics. There was information in, in, in philosophy. We were very interested in the Kantian view that, uh, that space is somehow or another innate uh, representation of the mind. We looked at the uh, geography. We looked at everything. Anyway, we came away with some idea of what the properties of maps are, and I'll show you these in a second. But let me just give you some idea about the differences that you would expect from someone like myself uh, finding his way from one part of London to another using either a map-like strategy or a, a route-like strategy, which is one of the primary al alternative ways of, of finding your way around. So let me say, let's uh, suppose I come out of the Warren Street Station here, and I want to find myself to University College. So if I, <clears throat> if I have um, a route-like statement, and quite often if you go walking in the country, you quite often follow a route, what the route tells you is a set of stimulus response uh, 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 connections which take you from one view of, of what's happening, one part of the scene, to doing something in that part of the scene to, 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 the next, uh, to the next station. So I come out of the station here, and then I walk east on Euston Road, which is this large road here, for a certain distance. I then turn right into Gower Street, and then after another distance, I go into the entrance of, uh, of UCL. Uh, and, and that's a way of getting from one place to the other. It's a very, very narrowly focused view. It tells you what the goal is of your actions, and it doesn't tell you what to do if anything changes uh, and, and disrupts your, your route. In contrast, you could follow a map. So you could do exactly the same thing. You could look at this map. You could see where Warren Street is, uh, where University College is, and look at the relationship between the two and realize that this is sort of east of it and how it's related to the various streets. And I have to point out particularly where it's related to the Wellcome Trust, <laughs> which is one of the major landmarks in our cognitive mapping structure. Uh, and as, as I'll mention in a second, in, in the cognitive mapping structure of many Hungarian scientists as well. Um, as an aside, when the Wellcome Trust was asked how do Hungarian scientists rate in terms of their ability to attract money from the Wellcome Trust, they, uh, this was a few years ago, they count as the seventh biggest university, the seventh most successful university uh, in, 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 in Britain. Um, so let's say you want to now follow this map, and you do the same thing. You come out here, you go down there, and you're heading down the Gower Street. But let's say, just when you get to this point, as is quite often the case in, in London, somebody is digging up the street. Somebody is building another building, or changing the routes, and so on and so on. So you can't go down there. So what you do then is you find yourself blocked 
on your standard route. And you have to find an alternative. The map gives you an alternative. The map says, oh, that's no problem. Just carry on going down uh, the, along Houston Road here until you come to Gordon Street and then make a right and come in the back way. So one of the things about maps is they give you this incredible flexibility and they give you a way of coping with the ever-changing changing environment. Okay, so as I say, we... Um, We were, um, we had mined the intellectual, uh, the intellectual heritage that we all enjoy in being part of a modern university, uh, and looked at, as I say, looked at psychology and, and many other areas. And these are just two quotes to give you some feeling for what, where our ideas came from and, and what the intellectual input was. So as I said, we immediately realized that E.C. Tolman as he was running rats and mazes in the 1930s and 1940s, had actually said, look, these guys look like they have some cognitive knowledge about how to get from one place to another. They know something more about the structure of the maze, what they have to do in the maze, than just go left, go right, go left, or right. And this was in uh, distinction to people like Hull and Spence, who thought that's exactly what the animals did. They just made a series of left, right turns at particular uh, points. And he said, um, we think they have something like a field map. They have some kind of a little map in their head. Now, he never ever actually knew how to make this into anything uh, more concrete. He didn't put any, any flesh on, on, on this idea. But he certainly had the idea. And he said, they use the tentative, cognitive-like map of the environment. And it's this map which indicates, as I've shown you, lots of different possibilities, different routes in them, uh, which finally determines how they will make them. And he never went very far beyond that, but he was tightly wedded to it. And we thought it was, an, you know, it was a brilliant insight. And we thought, as I'll show you in the next slide or two, we could put flesh on this kind of idea of a cognitive map. Another very strong influence came from, um, some, from a man called Stephen Toulmin, who was a philosopher. And Toulmin had this idea that you could distinguish between theories in science and, and um, hypotheses or laws in science by making the analogy to maps and routes. And as part of that, he actually did a lot of thinking about what the difference was. And so he said, well, one of the things about maps is that they are, they're, they're as it were, goal-free. The map maker doesn't start off with a particular goal in mind and then it's a map. He just makes the map. He makes a representation of the environment and that you can use for all sorts of different purposes. So to a man making a map, all routes are as good as each other. Uh, you, the users of the map may not be going the same place. They don't have to all go in the same way. Satisfactory map is route neutral, and this is very, very important. It represents the region mapped in a way which is indifferent as between starting points, destinations, and the life. So maps are not, they don't have built into them any kind of biological or uh, uh, primary motivations. You don't build a map because you're hungry and then you want to know where you are relative to the food. You build a map and then if you find out there's food there, you use that to, to guide your way. Um, routes or itineraries, however, are concerned with particular routes, starting points, destinations, and take a form as current. And so you can use maps, as you, in the last second, you can use maps to generate routes. You can't really generate routes, uh, maps from routes. It's very much, it's easy to go one way or the other. But the important thing is that maps give you a representation which is essentially goal-free, and which you can use for lots and lots of, 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 uh, of, of, of uh, uh, purposes, and uh, whereas for a route, you really do know where you want to get to. Okay, so when Adele and I started working on this, and I think this is the last quote, uh, I usually don't show so many quotes, um, we thought, okay, we need to actually say in very, very specific terms, because we had to make an, uh, and, and thought we would eventually make neural models of this, try to make this work as a way of, of generating a device which would actually do what we thought the rats could do. Um, a map of an environment is composed of a set of place representations. So now, just think about it, this idea of a place representation a place is an abstract concept. There is, play, this room is full of places and quite often there's nothing in those places. So you have to compute and, and say, how do you know this is a place? And you can know it by different ways and I won't go too much into it, but um, you can essentially say that a map is a set of place representations and the rules for getting from one to the other. It's no good having all of those place representations that I just showed you without knowing what the relationship is between them. 
If I want to go from here to there, I have to know the distance and the direction between the two of them. And that's one of the things we've learned that the brain now uh, actually does. And given, given a map, you can use them for lots of purposes, as I say. You can use them to locate yourself in an environment. And you can locate items such as rewards and punishments, so you know what to approach and what to avoid. Um, and to move from one place to another by any available route. This flexible idea of flexibility is very important. Importantly for the rest of my talk, it occurred to us that you, since you weren't building maps on the basis of rewards and punishments and other biologically driven motivations, there had to be a mechanism, a machinery, for actually building a map. And so we, and this was speculation, and we're still working on this, and I'll show you a little bit of evidence to, to support this, but we said exploration is behavior designed initially to build and subsequently update cognitive maps so that the hippocampus, this part of the brain, actually contains the mismatched machinery, the machinery for saying, I don't have a map of this environment or there's something wrong with my map of this environment. So the curiosity in this view is a, a, a major, major motivation. It's the driving of information incorporation into cognitive maps. And this is a powerful motivation for animals and we believe for humans as well. The idea that curiosity is a motivational in the first place, but actually you can see it if you look at a rat and you place a rat in a new environment and he's hungry, the first thing he does is he explores the environment. And then only when he has satisfied his, his uh, need to have this map of the environment does he then actually go and eat the food. And he'll walk over the food, he'll, he'll ignore it entirely. So curiosity then is part of the system for building maps. And it's part of the, our, our, our innate uh, nature to actually be curious and to actually want to know about our, uh, in this case, our environments, but probably uh, a lot of other things. So, um, and, and the way that works is, is just shown here. So if, if you're at A and you're moving along this vector AB, then the system will predict what you should see when you get to B. And if you don't see that, if you don't have the experience that's predicted by the map, then the, the system says, well, there's a mismatch here, there's something wrong, and you better stop doing what you're doing and start exploring. So that's the basic mechanism and the basic source, we believe, of, of at least one kind of curiosity. So when we got to this point, we said, okay, if this is a real theory, then it must make predictions. And we made lots of predictions, um, which were all testable. Um, and I think, you know, following what Michael said, if you, if you really believe that you have an idea about the way the world works, you should make predictions and they're testable. You should, and, you know, there's nothing like a beautiful theory killed by an ugly fact. And we all have to live by it. And Yuri and I <laughs> have, have had enough of our uh, really brilliant ideas <laughs> shown to be wrong. Uh, but we made predictions. And so we made predictions based on the actual fabric of the map, i.e., we needed other signals. We needed not only these place signals, but we needed to have information about the connections between the places. And so we said, well, these are probably something like vectors, and you, we should, there should be uh, sources of information saying how far apart the places are, what direction they are from each other, and also things like how fast the animal is moving to get from one place to another. And we also made predictions about what would happen to an animal if it lost its hippocampus, or to a human if it lost, if you lost your hippocampus. And this comes back to one of, uh, one of our interests in, 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 in for example, the, um, the translation of these ideas into sort of, say, medical research, where we think that, for example, Alzheimer's patients, who are, where the hippocampus is known to be one of the first areas in the brain is, uh, uh, affected, should show, and in fact do show, very, very severe uh, deficits in spatial navigation. So we're using that to try to translate some of our ideas in, into, uh, into um, uh, testable uh, predictions and, and, and perhaps ways of monitoring the onset and uh, development of Alzheimer's. So we made predictions and we predicted that animals would be deficient in navigation and exploration. Um, and I just briefly go through some of the uh, evidence which supports that and then come back to this whole idea of, of exploration. So, over the years, we, and mostly other people, have actually found those other kinds of spatial information that we had predicted. And that's very important. And uh, the, it, interestingly enough, the place cells are in this part of the hippocampal formation here, where we had found them, and they seem to be pretty hard, find it hard to get out of there. It's very hard to find place cells in any other part of the brain. 
They seem to be, there seems, and again, that's evidence that this part of the brain is highly specialized for perform, performing a particular kind of operation, at least in, in animals. Other areas, which are intimately connected with the hippocampus, contain other kinds of spatial cells. And uh, I'll just quickly go through some of these. I won't talk very much about them, and I won't uh, uh, go through too much of it, of the, the basis. About 1984, Jim Ronk in New York found another kind of very clear spatial cell called the head direction cell. Uh, in an area here called the precipitum, which actually connects to the hippocampus, uh, or actually connects to other areas which connect to the hippocampus. And these are cells which don't care about where the animal is, couldn't care less. And so if you make one of those heat maps and say, does it care more about this location or that location, they seem to fire all over the place. What they care about is the direction in which the animal is facing in the environment. They care about the fact that he's facing northeast and not southeast or southwest. And when I use these terms northeast and southeast, I don't mean that it's geomagnetic. I mean it's related to the environment the animal finds himself in. The system computes directions within the framework of, of the environment that the animal finds himself in. There are other cells which are, care about how far the animal is from a particular boundary or a landmark. Um, and then finally, and, and, and most spectacularly, as, as, as Edvard Moser and, and perhaps my Bert Moser will tell you, there is another set of cells found in the entorhinal cortex which have this grid-like structure which looks like a whole bunch of place cells. It looks like the place cells with hiccups where the, uh, the animal, every time the animal raises the brain says, oh, well, here's another place, here's another place, field, here's another place. Field. But importantly, they're not just a random collection of places. They have this beautiful hexagonal grid-like structure, which is laid out across the, uh, the face of, of, of most of the environments that the animal finds itself in. So somehow the brain is producing what looks like a Cartesian grid coordinate system. And you can very easily imagine, we all did, we broke out the champagne, because now we had information about uh, not only the places, but the, the heading directions, and also uh, the as it were, the metric of the map, the, 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 the way in which you could compute how far an animal had gone in a particular direction. Um, I won't go into any details. Uh, Edvard will tell you a lot more about these. It's a, the story is a little more complicated. We, don't, we can't retire yet or go and study other parts of the brain yet. We still have a lot to learn about the system, in particular how these uh, are put together. I want to tell you a little bit, how am I doing for time? Oh, I'm doing all right. Joseph, you know, where are you? <laughs> Fine, okay. Um, so the other side of the equation was that we predicted that animals which had damage in this part of the brain would find it hard to navigate. And specifically to use flexible navigation. They wouldn't have any trouble going down to the corner, turning left, going to the next corner, turning right, using a stimulus response type of strategy. They would have trouble finding their way by lots of different routes. And over the years, we've had a fantastic uh, piece of behavioral apparatus generated by Richard Morris at Edinburgh, which enabled or asked animals to swim in a swimming pool from any location that they were placed into the swimming pool to get to a hidden platform. And that's done a tremendous amount of good work for us, and many, many labs have them. In fact, I think every pharmaceutical company in the world has one of these, and certainly every, every uh, animal behavioral laboratory has them. But we've thought that perhaps we could do better. So over the years, we've invented a new type of uh, technique, behavioral technique, for asking animals to go from wherever they were in an environment to a particular location. And this is shown here. It's called the honeycomb maze because it looks like a honeycomb as seen from the top. And essentially what it is is 37 platforms sitting on pneumatic tubes. Each of one can be raised or lowered individually so that we can give the animal a set of choices. Any place he is, he can be confined to that platform and then given a choice of two platforms. So essentially we ask him, do you know how to get to the goal from this location? And we can change where the platforms are and change, uh, we keep the goal usually uh, constant, but we change the route by which the animal goes from one place to another. So we can essentially rule out route-like strategies. And this shows you the strategy, uh, uh, one example. Here's a, here's a goal, here's a starting platform here, the animal finds stuff, and all of a sudden two platforms come up. And I'll show you a video of this, I think it'll make it a lot easier to understand. And then the animal has to choose the best way to go, i.e. The, the, the platform which leads most directly to the goal. And I'll leave a little bit open as to what that actually means. Now he finds himself on the, this one, and now he's given again another choice. And sometimes 
we really make it hard for them. We don't give them a choice which leads directly to the goal is here. We give them a choice which is two not so good choices. One might be 90 degrees from the direction of the goal and one might be 135 degrees. And as you see in the video I show you, they can still do it. And they know the direction of the goal and they can actually make that computation. They can actually tell the brain, probably the hippocampus, can actually tell which is the better of a direction which is 135 degrees from the direction of the goal or one which is only, uh, uh, which is 180 degrees. So let me show you the video. which is here, and what you see is an animal sitting on a stock platform, and the goal is somewhere down here, out of view, and uh, he'll be presented with a series of choices, and his job is to figure out which is the best choice. Now, this guy knows the game, uh, and sometimes you might even notice he turns around and looks at me and says, oh, this is not a very good choice. Um, but usually, and what's nice about this, you can actually see him thinking. I used to talk about rats thinking in the 1970s, and I was laughed off the stage. People say, rats can't think, this is ridiculous, they can't think, you know. We're not even sure people can think, but, uh, and, I, <laughs> and I sometimes think some of recent events might be giving a bit of credence to that view. Um, anyway, he's sitting here waiting for platforms to come up, and I think what you'll see, he knows the direction, the direction he's looking, the goal is down here, and he knows where he wants to go, but he will, um, under duress, go where he uh, is given a choice. So the platform come up, you can see like that, and here he is, he says, yeah, I know, I can hear those platforms coming up, he knows there are platforms and choices, and he wants to go down here. He says, wait a minute, okay, now that, that's where he, I'm sitting over here, and he looks at me and he says, okay, where do I want to go? And that is the correct one. That's 135 degrees and this is 180 degrees from the direction of the goal. We can sometimes just force him and he knows if there's only one platform, just take it, don't hang around, food's waiting at the end. So he comes up here and now another one comes up. And you can see, again, he looks all over the place and he goes to the correct one. And as you see, he will progressively go through a series of, of choices which get him to the goal. And sometimes he doesn't have to wait, but sometimes you'll see now on this one he comes up and he actually, this is the correct one obviously, and he's thinking about it. So if you're interested in decision making theory, this is the, this is the, the behavioral task for you, I think. Okay, and now when he gets to the goal, and only after he gets to the goal do we see him. And I won't go into it, I won't labor it. They learn this very quickly. These are three different groups, and there's a big deficit in, uh, with animals that have damage in the hippocampus. Uh, I wouldn't be telling you this if there wasn't. Um, okay, so now um, I want to just say one or two things about, um, and uh, Ed Edvard and my Brit have just appeared. Uh, good timing. <laughs> um, just a, a little bit about our understanding of the mechanisms of this mismatch system, because it turns out we haven't really learned very much, and it's turned out to be much more difficult than we had anticipated, uh, finding out what the mechanism is. Um, part of it seems to involve this grid-like system in the entorhinal cortex, which um, I think Edvard will tell you a lot about, and, and perhaps my, my Brit will also tell you about. This, this system which seems to be laying out this grid-like structure, it turns out that that seems to be part of the mechanism for actually identifying new novel environments or changes to the environment. Um, and the reason I say that is work done by Caswell Barry, um, in which he had, did this very nice experiment in which he recorded these grid cells in two environments, one which is a familiar environment and then an unfamiliar environment which was shaped exactly the same to control for something. So the unfamiliar environment is, has a different wall, different smells and so on. And what you find is that when you put the animal in the familiar environment, either the beginning or the end of the, of the, uh, the trial, um, or in the, the end of the experiment, what you find is that you get this very nice grid-like structure uh, which, which I've already, already showed you. Um, and you get it at the end. But when you put the animal in the same size box, but now it's a new box, and the animal starts to explore, what you find is that the grid structure expands. And then it slowly contracts back as the animal becomes familiar with the environment, the new environment, to the canonical shape. So here is a very clear signal of uh, that, that the, the brain, and this part of the brain, uh, experiences this as a new and novel environment. And, and also uh, evidence that it actually is 
learning about it. And we're not, we're not paying the animal to do anything learning about it. He's not getting rewarded for learning about one environment rather than the other. He's doing it purely as a, as a part of, of understanding the environment he finds himself in. And you can see here's a graph which shows you get this huge increase in, in, in change in scale and then it slowly comes back over a day and, then it, it, and over uh, sometimes it takes more than one day. And the same thing happens in the play cells. The, the play cells uh, in, under these circumstances also show that the system knows that something's new. So in the a cell which fires in the south here in, in the uh, familiar environment, jumps to a new location. So we're beginning to get ideas about and, and ways in which we can see this novelty, curiosity-driven exploration actually uh, in, in practice. Now, one more point I want to make about it from the animal literature, and then I'll, and then I'll broaden out my, my talk a bit, um, is that it, there's not a lot of evidence on this, but it looks as though the animal's emotional state has a big effect on which of the strategies it uses. If an animal is calm and happy, then it biases him towards using this cognitive, exploratory uh, pattern of, of learning about the environment and actually uh, also about finding his way around the environment. And one of the good experiments that I can uh, call on to, to show this is done, something done by a colleague of mine many, many years ago. Some of the best experiments were done a long time ago. And we have this terrible, terrible tendency in science to forget anything that hasn't been done in the last two or three or five years. Uh, it, it's almost as though we have this cognitive uh, blindness to, to old things. But this was a fantastic experiment. It hasn't been repeated as far as I know. And it's very, very simple. It's quintessentially simple. You put an animal in a T-shaped structure and where there are two different colored arms at the end, one black and one white. And you don't let him go into the arms. You just block them off with these glass uh, panels so that he can see that there's a black uh, arm on the right-hand side and a white arm on the left-hand side. And then you say, OK, after a little bit of a while, we give you another choice and we see where you go. And if he, uh, he's not even rewarded for this actually. Um, if he's allowed to choose, he very often goes to the, the, the arm which has been changed. And I should say, what happens between here and here is that here the one arm, the left is white and the, black, the, the right is black and here they're both white. So one of them has been changed but they're now both the same color. So he has to remember where the white arm was before and where the black arm was. And he quite often goes to the the arm that has, is now changed. He goes to the novel arm. However, if you do something to frighten him, just before he makes that choice, he does the opposite thing. So instead of going to the arm which has, uh, has been uh, changed from black to white, he goes back to the safe arm. He goes back to the arm which is the safe arm. And I think this is a very important moral to this. The, you can shift by changing the, the atmosphere, by changing the, the emotional state of animals, and I think it's also true of humans, you can shift from the cognitive, you can shift the cognitive strategy, you can shift from this curiosity type of strategy to this much more narrowly focused, goal-directed, root-like strategy. And I think there's a moral there for, for a lot of our, our thinking about it. Okay, so let me just summarize the, 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 the work that I've, I've told you about. So we think the hippocampus provides a cognitive map uh, and it can identify the animal's location and it can show, it tells them how to go flexibly from one place to another. Um, there is com kind of competition between the different kinds of strategies and I think this is a general way of thinking about the brain that there are cognitive strategies which are in competing with the response uh, the more narrow response, uh, stimulus response strategies. And I think that's true across many of the cognitive domains. And exploration, according to us, uh, is behavior designed initially to build and subsequently update cognitive. It's, it's a, an, a cognitive uh, motivation to build maps. And, it has, and quite often in competition, when the animal is not frightened, it takes priority. Okay. So I want to general, in the last, do I have five minutes? Where, where is, yeah, five minutes. Okay. Thank you. I, I want to try to generalize this to um, a, a more general statement about cognitive strategies in general. And so as I say, if you think about individual problem solving, you can think that there are two ways to solve many problems. Uh, there's cognitive map-like ways, which is based on exploration, based on this broader understanding of the problems, uh, uh, what we would call a, a more cognitive strategy. Uh, as opposed to that, there are these root-like goal-oriented uh, strategies, which are really based on 
knowing what the goal is, and they quite often respond very strongly to rewards and punishments. And quite often these two are in competition with each other. Now if we generalize this to say scientific research, or even research of any kind in, 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 in that we find in the universities or elsewhere, I think it, there's a natural distinction between research in general, and one falls under the cognitive like, and the other falls on this much more directed, narrow focus of, 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 of what you want from, from the results of your research. For example, you might think that uh, blue sky research, or, or what, if you're on a grant panel and you want to kill a grant, what you say is, this is a fishing expedition, i.e. this exploratory type of research where you, you're, you don't really know what the hypothesis is, you don't really know what the answer is, and in general, if you did, you, why would you do the research in the first place? You, but it's an exploration of a new um, area. And to be honest, a lot of the important uh, ideas and findings in, in science come from that kind of research. You know, Galileo gets a telescope and he looks at the, the stars and he finds things that we had never ever expected, and that's true in general. As opposed to this translational research where you know what you're, the answer that you want, you know what the goal is. And we've already talked about Alzheimer's research, so it's true that quite often uh, we want to find the answer to a specific problem. And we know why we want to find the answer, and we hope we find the answer. So right now, for example, those of us who are involved in hippocampal and enterorhinal cortical research are really beginning, beginning to think we know enough about this system to be able to start to see how it falls apart in Alzheimer's. It's the first system that goes in Alzheimer's, and we think we can use our knowledge of that to, for example, produce animal models of, uh, uh, of Alzheimer's, see what's going wrong at at the biological level, or even psychological tests for the early detection of the spatial deficits that occur in Alzheimer's patients. And then in terms of the role of universities, again, there's this tension. You get, on the one hand, the, the remit of a university, as, 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 as Professor Ignatiev said, to do exploratory, open-ended research. And that's what we do. And that's because, I think, we're at least following the, the, uh, the impulses of, of our hippocampus and other areas of the brain, which are telling us we really need to know about the world. Uh, and, you know, we, uh, we have other things we're, we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be equipping people to go out into the world and actually use these exploratory things to answer questions in the world. We need to teach them skills for national and, and global uh, uh, citizenship. Opposed to that, there is the uh, very, very much more focused goal of a university uh, to train people for the professions, medical uh, and uh, legal and other professions, and uh, to equip them with specific skills and, and, and specific economic, uh, particularly economic skills. So uh, that's the end of what I want to say about that. I just want to add a few more words, um, because when I think about the CEU, um, I think that the CEU is doing both of those uh, functions. I think it's, it's actually um, doing them both very well. Tomorrow, as, as you heard, um, uh, Yuri Buzaki and uh, my Brit and Edvard Moser and I will be going to the University of Page to celebrate the 650th anniversary of, 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 uh, of Page. And so thinking about that, um, I, I, uh, and, 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 and reflecting on my, uh, my, my knowledge of, of historian universities and, and historian, particularly history of uh, Hungarian science, um, I think that you know, Hungary has produced a tremendous amount of, of incredibly no innovative, innovative scientists, some who have left uh, and went, for example, to the States, um, and, but many of who have stayed behind. And when I think about the, 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 the spectrum of, of uh, Hungarian universities, it seems to me that the CEU falls well within that spectrum. It looks to me like, maybe it's the wrong thing, it's just another Hungarian university, a good one, but just another Hungarian university. It looks like a, a modern liberal arts university, and I think it's doing a very good job at it. Um, it does the practical stuff on the one side. Um, so when I look through uh, and, and talk to people, I see that they're looking at bioethics. Um, they're looking at um, uh, both uh, the national and international uh, use of biotechnology. Uh, they're looking at what you, how you use the biobank. Um, they're training their students to be good economists, to go out into the world and um, work in the financial markets make a lot of money, uh, uh, hopefully also to do it uh, morally and, and, and otherwise. On the other hand, they're 
there's a lot of work on abstract subjects, and some of them are close to my heart. I mean, for example, there's a whole uh, program in the philosophy of space and time, uh, and the philosophy of linguistics and epistemology. There are even some people, I won't name any names, who are actually modeling the brain uh, functions uh, in, in cognitive sciences, and, um, and some people working on slightly more abstract uh, neural network research and big data. Um, so I, it looks to me like a good Hungarian university, and I, 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 I don't see how it could be uh, cast as anything else. And I would say, as an aside, I would really applaud uh, some of the efforts that have been made here to, for example, get a good gender balance on your staff, and particularly a good gender balance uh, between males and females in your students. Every university is trying to get there. Most of us haven't gotten there yet, and, and, and you've already gotten there. So all I can say in, 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 in ending um, is I hope the negotiations go well. I hope we get a good outcome. I hope the negotiations between the Hungarian government and the state of New York uh, pr produce a very good output. And I look forward to coming back in several years' time and being in the same place and giving another lecture on perhaps our, our latest research on, on the hippocampus exploration and curiosity. Thank you very much.